I'm James Wilkinson, co-founder of the EduTech Alliance, the organization dedicated to getting schools across the globe on track with their educational technology and keeping them there. Many schools have asked us about the approach we take to designing and uh, delivering our uh, educational technology projects, as they always seem to succeed. Um, there's no magic, it's common sense, but it has taken about 30 years to perfect the approach, and we thought it was now time to share it. So, um, take a look, uh, try it out for yourselves, and let us know how you get on. And in this first video of the series, we're going to cover the main details of the approach. Right, today we're just going to cover the basics uh, about projects and programs, um, what our approach is, and uh, also we're going to cover why projects fail. Um, if I didn't mention it, these slides are not going to be pretty, they're not going to be animated, uh, but they are going to be packed with content. So feel free to go to our site, um, download the uh, PowerPoints, and um, use them as you will. So let's kick off with projects. Okay, what's a project? Um, by the way, did I mention it wasn't going to be pretty? Uh, right, so a project is simply taking a concept into reality. Could be a building a house, could be um, putting in place a bridge, or it could be um, implementing an educational technology um, initiative uh, for your school. So let's see, there's only four things you need, four key ingredients. Um, you need to have an agreed set of requirements from your stakeholders. What is this project meant to achieve? You need, uh, or you will need, a set of resources. You're going to need uh, people, you're going to need money. Um, and uh, with that money, you're going to buy technology, software, etc., etc. Um, you're going to need to structure um, your project and have an agreed project approach so you know exactly how this thing is going to be delivered. And possibly most importantly, you're going to need support from your senior leadership team. Um, most of the projects we see uh, that fail, um, one of the reasons is that uh, they don't have this business support. And how do you deem your project to have been implemented successfully? Uh, it should be on time. It should be uh, to the plan that you have agreed in the project management. It should be on budget. So you've spent um, the resources um, in whichever uh, terms uh, that you said you're gonna spend. It should be to specification, so it meets those requirements. It should be fully adopted by the business. This is an implementation, not an installation. Um, and it should be proven to deliver the results that uh, you laid out at the outset in the requirements. So what's the difference between a project and a program? This is a question we get asked a lot. So let's start from scratch. A project, well, we just covered what that is. It's a, a finite piece of work designed to achieve a specific set of uh, requirements or objectives. Uh, a program is a portfolio of projects um, and they're designed to uh, align, to achieve an overall vision uh, for your school and um, they're part of the overall school strategy for educational technology. And we'll cover uh, vision and strategy in uh, a future video. So, top box. If you haven't got a vision and strategy, you have no way of knowing whether your project um, is aligned with the overall goals of the school and also no way of aligning uh, all the projects in the program um, to uh, achieve the overall goals. So basically, um, you have confusion and we see this an awful lot. If, on the other hand, you have a vision and a strategy for how to get there, then you have a context for being able to uh, align uh, all of the uh, projects, and some of these may be running in parallel, um, and uh, basically you have a smooth uh, and efficient way of uh, getting to your end goals. Um, in terms of roles, the project manager is responsible for running their individual project and achieving uh, the stated goals of that project. The program manager is responsible for choreographing uh, the overall portfolio of projects in the program um, and making sure that uh, the interdependencies, and there will be a number of these, um, are recognized and that uh, all of the projects um, are effectively coordinated in parallel. What's the key to project management success? 
risk reduction. If you live by the adage, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong, you're not going to be disappointed. So from our perspective, at the core, there's only three things you need. You need to have a clear approach, which you understand and your team understands, uh, which is going to uh, get you through this project. You need to have uh, a clear organization. Who's responsible for what? Who's the sponsor? Who's the project manager? Um, what are the roles of the people on the team? Uh, that needs to be um, crystal clear. Um, you also need to uh, document um, meetings, actions, specifications, um, and the, that documentation needs to be shared uh, amongst the team and the stakeholders uh, to make sure that uh, there's no room for misunderstandings and everyone's bang up to date. It's easier if you focus on the four C's as well. First of all, content. Focus on producing quality content as you go rather than worrying about polished presentations. And don't be afraid to take pictures of a whiteboard or sketches and cut it into a presentation. There really are no prizes for pretty. Communication. Make sure everyone is aware of everything. It's amazing how many missed little details or assumptions can come back to bite you. We share all project documentation with the whole project team. There are some reads that are mandatory, so uh, weekly meeting notes, and others are revised, but it's all up there for reference. Collaboration. All of our projects run on Microsoft Teams. It's a really efficient way to work together, talk together, and hold project documents. If you're not using Teams, we strongly suggest you use something very similar. And finally, consistency. In naming, it's amazing how many times people understand different things from the same term. Build a project thesaurus or a wiki in Teams to make sure you're being consistent. Consistency in time. We use week numbers across all projects. They're built into all calendars, such as Mac or PC, and are super useful to tie everything together. Consistency in meetings. So we use standard agendas and always end up with a review of the outstanding actions and we compile a uh, rolling actions list. And consistency in documents. Um, if you have standard document templates, then it makes life super easy to produce documents such as meeting notes, but also makes it easy to read and everyone's just focusing on the content uh, rather than trying to decipher uh, what the document means. So that's it for reducing risk. So let's move on to the meat of this presentation, our project approach. So the background slide here gives you a indication as to our project approach. We've often been asked to talk about it at major events, uh, but this is the first time that we're really unpacking it in detail and uh, sharing it for all to benefit from. There really are only three phases to any project. Think, build and operate. So let's go into detail. Think is basically all about the design work, defining the business case, obtaining the requirements, selecting software and technology, working out the processes and the technical architecture, confirming the data, and possibly most importantly, ensuring that the project aligns with your school's overall vision and the other projects in your current program. Think can also include feasibility studies or proof of concept mini projects to ensure that what you're planning is gonna work for you. It's always good practice to get management approval for the project at the end of the think phase before committing time and resources in build. Build is the implementation of the project, but not just the technology. It's ensuring that your staff and pupils are trained to use it and the processes around it. Service levels and policies are firmly in place. Operate, the day-to-day -day operation of the project's deliverables in your school's context. This is your opportunity to measure how well it's working and to identify opportunities for improvement, which there will always be. The most common mistake we see is schools skipping the think phase and jumping straight into build, almost always to their cost of regret. It's common knowledge across the information technology industry that if a mistake in think costs $1 to correct, then it's going to cost between $10 to $100 to put it right if it passes through into build and then potentially hundreds to thousands of dollars if it's only caught and operate when the project's live and potentially crashes uh, in your school or just doesn't work as it's meant to. 
In this video series, we're going to show you how to keep your mistakes to the $1 variety. And here's how. A very simple structure for designing and implementing all types of educational technology projects that belies its wealth of depth and flexibility. It ticks the boxes of two key project management mantras. Keep it simple and get it on one page of A4. We've used this model for over 30 years on a vast variety of information technology implementation projects, ranging from the modestly sized up to the multi-million dollar global variety, and it's never failed us. Despite trying to find a more glamorous name for it, the box model has always stuck with our staff and our clients, so here it is. It's going to be the foundation for this video series and covers the think and build phases of your project. So let's dive in. The horizontal rows, these, are known as strands. The individual boxes are known as work packages. We have sub subtly different box models to accommodate various types of projects, slight variations in the work packages, but they all have the strands of strategy, people, process, technology, data, and project management. Um, we may also add a location strand if we're creating or modifying physical buildings, but that's it. It's standard, it's set, and everyone knows it. And we've never come across a project that doesn't fit. But let's keep things simple for now and use this version, which is focused on package software implementation, uh, just as an example. And let's start with the strands. So for a project to be a success, the content of the strands needs to be perfectly aligned, a bit like the components of a car's engine. You'll soon see how the output from one strand becomes the input for another to ensure that they're completely in sync uh, and the results uh, work for you. So let's start at the top with the strategy strand. The project has to fit snugly with how your school is now, i.e. the current state, and how it's going to be in the future, the vision. The project should be a component of achieving this vision and should fit within the overall program. You're also going to need to know how much it's going to cost, what benefits it's going to bring, and how you're going to go about implementing it, because people always tend to ask. So the vision, which is the first work package here, paints a picture of how your school's going to look once the project is in place. And that needs to be defined, and that needs to be communicated. And the strategy describes uh, how you're going to get there. The business case weighs the cost of the project, both the capex for putting it in place and the operational costs, the opex for running it on a day-to-day -day basis against the benefits that the project's going to bring to the school. The deployment roadmap is concerned with defining the roadmap for the project's implementation. You may well want to deliver your project in several releases um, and these need to be agreed as to what the functionality of each one is. And lastly here, the performance measurement is focused on defining how you're going to measure whether the project is meeting the business case once it goes live. Now to the people strand. Functional requirements. Your people need to tell you what they want from the project, i.e. their requirements. And by people, we mean all stakeholders, teachers, pupils, administrators, parents, and anyone who's going to be impacted. Organizational design. Normally, your organization is going to need to change to accommodate the finished project. Maybe you'll need to hire new staff. Maybe you'll need to create new roles. But the organizational design needs to be put in place to accommodate this. Communications. Super importantly, you need to decide how and when you're going to communicate about this project to the stakeholders. Change management is normally the toughest part of all of these initiatives. And lastly, skills and training. Some of your stakeholders, at least, are going to need new skills to know how to get the most out of what you're implementing, as well as understanding the service levels they can expect and the policies they need to adopt. Your training will be based on the processes that you'll define in the next strand. Now to processes, arguably the most important strand, and some of our clients call it the meat in the sandwich. Uh, so here we're going to introduce a, a new term, capability or more specifically, te technology-enabled capability. If you think about it, you only implement technology to give you the capability to do something you couldn't do before, or to do something you currently do more efficiently. If your project doesn't fall into these two categories, then you really need to think about why you're doing it in the first place. So, process definition. 
In operate mode, your stakeholders will need to follow processes with the technology and data you've put in place seamlessly and efficiently supporting them. Defining these processes is the keystone which allows your end users to visualize how things are going to work day to day and for your technology team to build a suitable supporting infrastructure. So moving on to service level and policy definition. If your processes define the way your capability is going to operate on a day-to-day -day basis, then service levels define what your users can expect in terms of things like performance, uptime, response to issues. Conversely, the policies define how the capability will be used and, equally importantly, how it shouldn't be used. Process implementation. Here, you're going to decide how you're going to implement the processes within your organization. Are you going to implement them all at once? Are you going to implement them uh, to everyone at the same time? Or are you going to do it in stages? And also, what is the way in which you're going to handle the change management that comes uh, around implementing these processes? And lastly, measurement and improvement. Uh, this is where you define how you're going to monitor the success of your project and identify those all-important improvement opportunities and uh, feed those back in. So, on to the technology strand. Solutions architecture. Here is where you identify your technology solution based on the requirements that you've gathered from your stakeholders in the first work package of the people strand above. Here's also where you work out how it's going to integrate with your existing environment as no project is an island. This is also where you'll be performing vendor selection, negotiating your deals with suppliers, and feeding the numbers back up into the business case. In package architecture, you'll be defining in detail how your selected software solutions are to be configured, customized, and integrated into your school ecosystem, based largely on the processes and policies that you defined within the process strand above. Installation configuration, exactly as it says in the box. That's where all the technology and software is configured and integrated. And finally, but most importantly, testing. Here there are three stages, unit, integration, and stress. In unit testing, you're gonna test each component individually to check it's working. In integration testing, you'll use the processes you define to check that the technology supports the operation that you've envisaged. And in stress testing, you're effectively putting the project under low to see what it's capable of withstanding. It's designed to mimic both day-to-day -day and also exceptional situations. Moving on to the data strand. So going back to the car analogy, consider data as your project's fuel. It's going to feed everything, and you know what happens uh, when you get poor gasoline. So source data quality assessment. Uh, early on in the project, we recommend defining what source data your project is going to require from other systems in the school and checking that's available and that the quality is good. This is going to feed into the solutions architecture work package of the technology strand up above. Uh, data integration. You're then going to need to hook your new solution up to its data feeds in the data integration work package. This is essential for the work to be performed in the testing work package. So um, up here. Um, static data setup over here. Uh, any static data such as logins, names, classrooms, addresses will all need to be uploaded and confirmed in this work package. And finally, legacy data import. If you're converting from an existing system, the existing data, or what we refer to as legacy, uh, will need to be uploaded as well. And last but not least, project management. So, first up, project design. Here you're going to define the project. What needs to be done to deliver it? What are the roles? And who's going to do what? Do you need external resources? And how much are they going to cost? It's an old industry rule of thumb that the cost of solutions integration is about 10 to 50 times the price of the software. And this has risen markedly since software as a service became available. So don't let the cheap price of software fool you as to the total cost of ownership of a project. Anyway, all this needs to feed into the business case uh, here for the cost elements. In project design two, you're gonna to need to define exactly what work is required in each work package. Who's gonna perform it? and what they're gonna to do to deliver it. This is done in the project definition document, which we're gonna cover in a future video in this series. Now here in project planning and tracking, uh, the project definition document defines what needs to be done in each work package and by whom. 
but not time scales and not the interrelationships uh, of the tasks. So you're going to do this in this work package. So you create some form of project plan where you can develop a timeline for the project and track progress against it. Your plan can range from some dates on a piece of paper to something more sophisticated, which uses a custom project planning tool to capture times, resources, risks and issues. And there are many of these available. It's really up to you, but we advise that the plan is structured by strand and work package for consistency and understanding. And again, we'll be covering uh, project design in a later video in this series. The final two challenges as project manager that you have will be to get your school ready to accept and adopt your project in the business mobilization package here and also to keep all the relevant people uh, informed uh, as to progress and uh, issues in the stakeholder management package. So at first glance, that's probably a lot to take in, but there's a natural break here between think and build phases and something uh, we call the inverted L for lack of a better name. The colored boxes that need to be completed for the think phase are effectively these um, colored boxes here in the uh, inverted L shape, surprisingly enough. This will provide you with all the material uh, that you need to go back to your sponsor and school's management to say with confidence, this is what we understand you want and why. This is how much it's going to cost and how we can deliver it. Here's how it's going to work in day-to-day -day running of the school. And this is how it fits into school's overall vision and technical ecosystem. So basically answering the key questions before you start committing resources and time uh, to implementing, i.e. the build phase, which is here in all of the gray boxes. So once you've done the colored boxes, uh, it's pretty good time to get formal approval to proceed. And once you've received the green light, it's time to start planning your project in detail. So effectively in the project design, you've planned it at a high level. You'll now go down to planning in detail and performing the project planning and tracking, etc. Um, again, the subject of another, yet another video in the series. Before I leave you today, I want to touch on a key issue here. Some projects fail and some projects succeed. Why? So I'd like to share an observation with you. From a decades of experience, we've come to realize that you need to consider each and every work package in the box model if you want to make your project a success. After consideration, you may discount one or two. So for instance, you're putting in a brand new system, you don't have any legacy data, so you don't have any legacy data to import. But you do it actively and consciously, rather than just forgetting about them or not thinking it counts. The think really counts. So I can't stress it enough. Think before you build. So too often we've been called in to review sick or failed school educational technology projects, and they mostly look like this. It's an installation rather than an implementation. Few of the work packages have been considered, and the ones that have haven't been done very well. So the usual story is that someone came across an amazing looking software at a conference and decided it was a must have for the school. The price was great, it was software as a service, really low monthly fee, you could pay by credit card, and the salesperson promised it could be up and running within hours or days. The school simply had to have it, and it did install super quickly, and that's when the problem started. So, no one knows how knew how to use it for their day-to-day -day, um, activities because there were no processes to find. And there was also little or no training. Then someone started asking where the data they were entering was going, and there were a lot of blank looks. A little later, someone else started complaining that the new system was showing different values to an existing system for apparently the same piece of information, and asking which one was correct. So you get the picture. We always talk to our members about TCO, or Total Cost of Ownership. As with so much in life, what seems to be like a bargain at first turns out not to be. And very often, those responsible have moved on, leaving you to clean up the mess. So, the real shame is that situations like this waste so much time, frustrate so many people, and damage the credibility of the school and the people involved in the project, uh, making it really tough to overcome skepticism for the next project. So we hope that you'll follow the box model in its entirety and not the installation model that you see here. 
Well, that's all for me on project management basics. In the next videos in the series, we'll dive into more detail on the strands and the work packages and the techniques we use, uh, documentation, etc., etc. Um, I congratulate you for lasting until this point. Please like the video, but only if you really did, and drop us a line if you want to know more. Now, all of the videos in the series and the presentations used to produce them can be found on our website at the link above. So, until next time.